Hey everybody, this is AHA Computing. In a nutshell, I'm your guide, Alex Nugent, and this episode is about the adaptive power solution. So in a previous episode, we concluded with something like this. We, we want to get a very low power uh, processor circuit that is also capable of adaptation, the ability to change. And uh, consequently, that results in the parts breaking. Uh, the memory that we would use to hold the synaptic weights, for example, would constantly be, would be breaking, would be volatile, it would decay. And uh, consequently, we needed a mechanism to repair this. And we introduced the idea of a fixer circuit, which would be an extrinsic circuit that would repair the parts. And we showed that it didn't really work. Uh, for a couple of reasons, but watch the other episode if, uh, if you haven't. So what we need, rather than an extrinsic fixer circuit, is an intrinsic mechanism of repair. Okay, so intrinsic, if you look it up, uh, is of or relating to the essential nature of a thing, something that's inherent. And another definition is anatomy situated within or belonging solely to the organ or body part on which it acts. Okay, this, to, to be intrinsic means that it's sort of built into the very fabric of the thing. Okay, it, it just happens because that's what it is. And what we need is an intrinsic mechanism of repair. I mean, the, the system all the parts are constantly breaking, then we need them to constantly be fixing themselves. And the, the fixing needs to be intrinsic. It just needs to happen. We can't communicate events to a fixer circuit and the fixer circuit could break and then it's like, it, it, just, it needs to happen as an intrinsic process. And so the question becomes, well, what if constant adaptation, which is the thing that we're trying to achieve, is the mechanism of repair? Right? I mean, think about that. Like, if your house is breaking, which it constantly does, and you have to go out and patch the roof and change the, you know, fix the tiles and, and replace the, uh, the stove when it breaks and, you know, things like that, and, you know, the house is constantly breaking and you're constantly fixing it. And so the act of fixing is sort of this act of adaptation. It's, it's kind of one and the same thing. To adapt is to fix. So what if... This mechanism of constant adaptation, which is what we're after, really is the mechanism of repair. What if they're one and the same thing? Right? Which leads us to a pretty deep question. What is the essential nature of adaptation? If we're searching for this intrinsic process that could operate sort of everywhere at the same time, sort of inherent to this, to this system, um, this intrinsic process, what is... What is it? What is the essential nature of adaptation? So I'm going to take a, a, a brief aside and uh, destroy the planet uh, in order to <laughs> explain um, what I'm after here. Okay, so imagine you have the planet. It's this nice sphere, and it was a sphere because gravity has caused all the lumps of matter to attract and, and hold themselves into this uh, nice uh, sphere. This is the result of gravity. And, and now you have this uh, asteroid that comes along and hits it, okay? And it temporarily perturbs, okay? So, so parts might fly off, um, and shockwaves might travel around the planet and blah, 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 blah like this, right? But then uh, it comes back together again, okay? And so if you imagine that, that the intrinsic state of the planet is a sphere, uh, and you perturb that, um, the intrinsic nature of the thing, gravity, uh, will pull it back together again. It will repair itself. Right? I mean, in this case, all the living things on the planet are dead, but it doesn't really matter. We're talking about, you know, the, the Earth as a, as a spherical body, you know, flying through space. And the, the intrinsic thing here is literally the laws of physics, okay? And so this, this sort of gives us an idea. Um, you know, imagine you have a system that is uh, described by some potential energy function. And uh, 
there's a, a minima to that. Okay, now what happens if you're in some, some state configuration, uh, you're going to feel a force that is going to draw you uh, to lower your potential energy. Okay, and so this is sort of an example of it. Your, your state is going to um, be pulled into some potential energy minima. And so what if we could find some configurations of uh, nature, some, some inherent processes in it, such that when nature just minimizes its potential energy, it also solves our problem. And people have been thinking about this for a while, and there's actually lots of examples of it out there. And here's one example. It's called a minimal surface. You take these, these wire um, meshes and you put you know, soap bubbles in them, and the soap bubbles uh, will uh, arrange themselves into these minimal surfaces. Uh, shown here by um, by the, the bubble surface. Given given the constraints uh, formed by the wire, uh, the the computation of this minimal surface is, is just computed naturally through the laws of physics. Right? The surface tension of um, soap bubbles just uh, arrange themselves in order to solve this particular problem. So wouldn't it be cool if we we could do something like this? We could just encode our our problem as this potential energy function and we just turn a switch on and because it's just nature it just converges to a solution and if anything perturbs it it'll just you know move it right back again because that's how physics and nature works but there's a problem okay we're after you know brain like stuff um, we're not interested in solving very specific problems like minimizing uh, the surface um, of, you know, soap bubbles or something. We, we want to do more generic, higher level things like perception, planning, control, brain-like stuff. And brains and all living systems and most other self-organized systems on this planet don't minimize their potential energy. Uh, actually, they do exactly the opposite of that. And from a physics perspective, um, it's, it's kind of remarkable. Okay, like you and I are composed of all of these molecules and atoms, and we are, for all practical purposes, this like walking pile of mush. Okay, we're we're <laughs> we're we're jiggly, we're gooey. Our brains are like the consistency of porridge, um, and yet we hold shape. Okay, we are we're constantly repairing ourselves. In fact, the act of living is the act of not dying, and dying is to decay. It's to decohere, it's to break apart. To be alive is to constantly fix yourself. And so this is what the father of quantum mechanics, uh, Schrodinger, started to uh, dwell upon. Um, now, you know, whenever I was taught physics, um, quantum mechanics, I, I remember my professor, he, he sort of he presented it as if Schrodinger had just gone off the deep end or something. He just like was looking for a life force, he said, and implied that Schrodinger had kind of lost it. Uh, but Schrodinger had not lost it. He was um, basically hot off of you know formulating um, <laughs> you know the wave equation for quantum mechanics. Like you know, there's Heisenberg and there's there's Schrodinger. I mean, these are the founding fathers of quantum mechanics, and. Uh, He's looking around at life going, whoa, this, there's got to be some way to explain this, okay? And so he published this series of lectures, but part of, the, part of this, uh, uh, this book that he called What is Life? Um, it was a formulation of these lectures that he gave. And he asked this question, how can the events in space and time, which take place within the spatial boundaries of a living organism, be accounted for by physics and chemistry. I mean, effectively, he's just saying, look, you know, life, the universe, and everything. Um, well, if everything is life in the universe, what the heck is life? It's all around us. It is us. And it's weird that our physics doesn't actually describe it. It should describe it. It's, we're not like magical creatures. We should obey the laws of physics, and we should be able to understand what's going on. And he made a bunch of... Uh, uh, really amazing observations, uh, some of which would basically led to the discovery of DNA. I mean, he described 
that something like this should exist. Okay, now what, another thing he said, which is very curious, he said, living matter, while not eluding the laws of physics, as established up to date, is likely to involve other laws of physics, hitherto unknown, which, however, once they have been revealed, will form just as integral a part of science as the former. Okay, so he's saying, look, uh, if you look at living systems, they're not disobeying the laws of physics. I mean, the, the big one is thermodynamics and the second law, which says things will move towards disorder. But what he's saying is that we're, we're ordered so that we, we export entropy into the environment. We basically, by being energy dissipating systems, um, we're not closed, you know, box, or, you know, separate from our environment. We're part of it. Uh, therefore, the, the laws of thermodynamics, uh, or the second law, doesn't really apply to us. It applies to the bigger picture. Um, so it's not outside of the bounds of us understanding it. And we, we should have uh, another level of understanding that describes living matter. Okay? Now, to be alive is to repair yourself, is to adapt constantly, is to not die. And there should be some laws out there that describe it. Okay, now... Just look, this is, this is living matter. On the left, we have neurons, uh, such as what occurs uh, 100 billion or so times in, in your cortex, in your brain. And on the right, we have a river delta uh, from space. Okay, and these are, these are very similar looking structures. They are energy dissipating systems. Uh, neurons are not objects in the sense that, say, you know, a screwdriver is an object. Uh, you know, if I put this, this screwdriver down and I come back a week later, it's still going to be a screwdriver. But if I took a neuron out of your head and I put it down on the desk, I walked away, I came back, it's going to be a pile of goo, all right? And <laughs> it'll probably have been digested by some fungus or something. Um, it's not going to be there anymore. It's going to have decayed away. Uh, it is an energy dissipating system, and it is, in essence, a river. Uh, the structure of a neuron, uh, it, it's held in place by the flow of these things called neurotrophins. There's these particles that are flowing that are keeping the, the axons and the dendrites in place. It's a flow system, just like the, just like the river. Okay, so here we have Schrodinger. You know, he's, he's saying, look, uh, there's, there's got to be some other laws of physics. Uh, that should explain this behavior, um, or at least some formulation that will bring this to light. And it's going to form an integral part of science, as we understand it, because we're just trying to understand what's around us. All right? So um, physics describes lots of things, and up until then, it really had failed um, completely to address what the heck is going on in living systems. All right? Well, remember our question here. What is the essential nature of adaptation? We arrived at this through the, through the idea of repair. And um, to repair yourself is really to be alive. It's, well, maybe he's asking the same thing. Maybe there's this, there's something going on all around us that can explain this, the sort of intrinsic essential nature of adaptation. Well, people have been saying this for a long time. And here's, here's four examples, um, but there's more people and they've been saying this for a long time. So if you, if you don't know uh, about this, then just go out and look it up. Um, it's just not popular. But all of these people have formulated what effect is a new law of physics. Um, and if it's not, it doesn't apply to everything. It applies to, you know, within certain contexts, just like every law of physics does, right? I mean, relativity describes the big things. Quantum mechanics describes the little things. Electricity and magnetism describes this thing over here. Like, we have all these theories that describe different, different aspects of, of the universe that we live in. And there should be a theory that is able to account for, explain, and help us predict living systems, Ecosystems, plants, you know, brains, neurons, animals, you know, all of this stuff. Maybe even other systems that look just like living systems, lightning bolts, rivers, things like that. Um, okay, well, people have been saying this for a while. So here's, let me introduce you to 
some of them, a man named Bijan uh, from MIT, now he's at Duke, uh, and he has something he calls constructal law. And he says, for a finite sized system to persist in time, to live, it must evolve in such a way that it provides easier access to the imposed currents that flow through it. What is he saying? He's saying that that the living, living matter, which doesn't have to be what is considered biological, it could be, it could just be something else, a, a flow system of any sort. There's stuff that flows through it. In order for that thing to survive, in order for it to live, it evolves in time in order to increase the current flow, right? It's a flow system and it's just trying to increase the flow of current. Uh, there was another guy who postulated before Bejan uh, by the name of Swinson. Uh, he is a philosopher, um, and he said, quite logically, uh, that a system will select the path or assembly of paths out of available paths that minimize the potential or maximize the entropy at the fastest rate given the constraints. Again, he's, he's talking about a flow system. He's talking about an energy dissipating system, and he's saying that 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 the evolution in time of this system will, will happen in such a manner as to increase the dissipation of energy, right? Bajan is talking about flow, and, and, and Swenson is talking about um, the dissipation of energy. Um, there's another guy, uh, Jorgensen. Uh, I apologize tremendously if I have butchered your name. Um, he's been at this for a long time, I mean, since the 70s, and more recently he's published a book um, and he's looking at, you know, uh, eco um, ecosystems and uh, living systems, taking lots of data, and he's trying to understand this. And he says it uh, a little differently. He says the path to maxim maximizing of time derivative exergy, uh, exergy under the prevailing conditions will be selected. Now, his, his exergy is, uh, is akin to the structure of the system, right? So... Um, the, the dissipation of energy is one way to think of it. The other way to think about it is the, the structure that is built up in order to dissipate the energy. So he's thinking about it sort of opposite. And now there's this new guy, uh, England, out of MIT, who has derived some, this, this process basically from very basic physics. And it's basically, in a nutshell, dissipation-driven adaptation of matter. Uh, he's saying the same thing, and, and he's applying it really to Darwinian evolution, but really just, you know, the system will go with the flow, and it's going to maximize the flow, and all of these people are talking about energy dissipating systems, and they're all saying the same basic thing, and they have been saying this for many, 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 many years, okay? So, you know, when Schrodinger is saying there's, there will likely be other laws of physics, here you go, right? There's four people just here, but there's even more people out there who have stumbled upon this on their own and in, in just observing the world around us and how things tend to organize themselves all arrive at very, very similar conclusions. And not just abstract stuff. They can make predictions now, okay? It's been derived from basic physics. Uh, Bejan is able to make lots of predictions. His take is... is uh, well, I don't know exactly how it occurs, but it does occur. And if you know that, then you can predict how things ought to evolve in time. And he does, and it works out. He makes predictions, and he's filled textbooks. I mean, look at this thing. Here, this is one of the textbooks. And it's, it's applied to all sorts of stuff, all right? He's, he's sort of cracked open a nut, and it's bearing fruit, right? Now, England has is, is just derived it from some basic physics. Um, What's happening now is the emergence of, I think, a new era in physics. And that new era is understanding living matter. When I say living matter, I don't mean biology. I mean other things. I mean this commonality between neurons and lightning bolts. What is the common thing between them? Okay. So this does exist. Lots of people are saying it. Uh, if you don't believe me, then believe them. And if you don't believe Swenson um, because he's an independent, um, maybe you'll believe Bejan in England because they are uh, from MIT. Okay, so <laughs> this is happening. This is this is a, a new understanding about how living matter organizes. 
And so we can, we can change our concept of this potential energy function with a minima encoding our solution, and we can flip it over, and we can say what we're trying to do is maximize the energy dissipation of this system. So we have some state, and it evolves in time in order to maximize the dissipation of energy. And if we can encode our solution as the, the maxima of energy dissipation, then the system will evolve in time towards that maxima, and we will have our intrinsic mechanism of repair. But the problem is that none of these folks really discussed a mechanism, and what we need is a mechanism. We need to build this, we need to exploit it, we need to put it into our electronics and um, drive it with energy potentials and have the system evolve itself to solve our problems. And that's what the AHA circuit is. That's an intrinsic adaptation mechanism. Uh, it's energy dissipating pathways competing for conduction resources, right? So if I added myself to that list of these postulates about what's going on, this is what I say it is because I arrived at it from the perspective of needing a mechanism. Now if you look at all of these different examples in nature, you find these competing energy dissipating pathways. And, you know, here it is, here it is, here it is. It's a fractal repeated over and over and over again. This is true in plants as well as it's true in lightning and in your lungs and in your arteries and veins and neurons and all over the place, right? So how do we get this into electronics? Well, what's amazing is that this device called a memristor is effectively an adaptive energy dissipating pathway. Okay, it's like a riverbed. It, as you pass current through it, it will change its resistance, right? The riverbed will get, will get bigger. And the way that you, you get this mechanism is that you, you make these memristors compete for energy dissipation, right? So we're, we're sort of, we're taking this, uh, this process, which just manifests itself in nature, and we're looking at the building block, and we're trying to take that and put it into our electronics. And it's, it's a bit kludgy, it's not completely self-organized, but we're, we're giving the system the degrees of freedom that it needs in order to perform this energy dissipation maximization scheme. Okay, so we've detailed all of this. Uh, last year we published a paper called AHA Computing for Metastable Switches to Attractors to Machine Learning, in which we show how this basic building block uh, if you just start to learn how to use it, you can apply it to all of these problems. Uh, and you can do the kind of things that brains do. You, you, can, you can do logic and you can do computing, but you can also do pattern recognition and inference and combinatorial optimization. Uh, you, can, you can start to solve all these problems with this new intrinsic building block. Right? So an aha computing is, is really just asking the question, how do we use what appears to be a very foundational mechanism. And uh, how do we get it to uh, solve our problem and in the process dissipate more energy? Okay. Uh, so to review, uh, we wanted a low power solution that could adapt. Uh, but in order to get that, uh, the parts will constantly break. Consequently, we needed a mechanism to rip, repair those parts. We postulated a intrinsic fixer circuit, uh, but this didn't solve the problem because the fixer circuit would need fixing or it would introduce lots of communication, which just consumes more power and we're trying to reduce the power, so that didn't work. Uh, and we looked at um, in, intrinsic mechanisms of adaptation, right? And we asked the question, what if adaptation is the intrinsic mechanism of repair? Um, what would that look like? And that, that got us to ask this fairly fundamental question, which is, what is the essential nature of adaptation? And that led us to look at the work of Schrodinger, one of the founding fathers of quantum mechanics, who postulated that, that we should be alluding um, to some new laws of physics. There should be some laws of physics that explain living systems, uh, explain how they behave in time, what in essence they are. And uh, that led us to the work of Bejan, Swinson, England, Jorgensen, um, there's some others here, uh, Morowitz, Slotka, which I, I haven't uh, talked about, and there's even other people out there, and they're all saying essentially the same thing. Now, in order to exploit this sort of 
new law of physics, um, and when I say law of physics in quotes, this really applies to certain condition, uh, what's called non-equilibrium thermodynamics. It's, it's, what we need is more of an understanding about how living, um, living matter organizes itself. Um, that led us to this, to this idea that we could exploit this phenomena by finding an intrinsic mechanism that, that did this. And uh, we arrived at the AHA circuit, which is an energy dissipating pathways competing for conduction resources um, as the basic mechanism. And we're saying uh, we're going to take memristors as those energy dissipating pathways and we're going to have them compete for energy dissipation um, in order to, to get this circuit out of it. And uh, you know the AHA circuit is an electronic realization of this mechanism and AHA computing is just exploiting AHA nodes to solve algorithmic problems. It's basically saying, look, there's this building block that occurs throughout nature, which is the competing energy dissipating pathways. And let's understand how that works. And let's see if we can exploit it to solve problems for us. And the answer is, I believe, yes, we can do it. And we published a big paper last year showing all these different things that we can do. And we are now uh, specifying um, new type of chip architectures that utilize memristors um, and applying it to machine learning um, and other forms of computation. Uh, and it's really exciting. And uh, you know what? You should come join us because I think this is the future of electronics. So this is a big part of the future of electronics. Um, this is this new era of understanding what living matter does. And figuring out where that boundary is. It might not be biology.